Hi, Sam. Uh, great to have you here today. Um, I'm looking forward to talk to you um, about having meaningful sales conversations across the whole sales cycle. Okay. So having great prospecting outreach, having good demo calls, discovery calls, like, and really connect with, with your prospect and customer along the way. Yeah. Um, before we get started, maybe you can quickly share who you are and how you've ended up in sales and why you love sales. <laughs> oh my gosh, how much time do you have? Um, well, first, thanks for thanks for having me. So lovely to speak with you and on my favorite topics, uh, no less. But my background, I, I've been in enterprise new business sales for about 15 years almost now, which uh, makes me feel so old at this point, but um, I, I think many, like many of you, I fell into sales. Um, it wasn't a career I dreamed about. You know, I wasn't a six-year-old thinking I'm going to be a salesman. Um, probably more along the ballerina uh, track, which never worked out. Um, but I fell into sales, and I think what I really love about the idea of selling is that we are solving a challenge for people, right? So. This isn't about me selling a product to you or skincare or something like that, you know, where I'm hopeful that you'll buy it so that I can make ends meet. This is about looking for an opportunity to solve a true challenge that our buyers have. So whether it's a technology, whether it's a revenue gap, whether it's efficiencies, whatever it is, right, we have such an opportunity to help our clients to look for what keeps them up at night or what their biggest issues are, and then to plug that gap together. I also think that many people love sales just like I do because your your effort right in sales really pays off in terms of your financial reward. So I was actually just speaking to somebody today who is formerly a teacher and an award winning teacher, and her pay is identical, you know, to somebody else who is a teacher that might just kind of phone it in every day. Whereas sales, the more exceptional you are, the better you do. Yeah, that, that's completely true. I totally understand that. Um, I've learned that your favorite acronym is SMYMK. <laughs> like show me, show me you know me. <laughs> yeah, cl close up a little SMYKM. Yeah, I should know it by heart at this point, right? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, I think this really bleeds into every part of sales, right? Show me you know me. And I think what's interesting about this is that so many people just don't do their research in advance of meeting someone. So I speak to sales reps all the time who don't think that they need to do any research before discovery calls. They think they can just show up and wing it because they're super senior and they know what they're doing. But what I love about this concept, right, and kind of the, the showstopper here is if you show up to a call with a brand new client, a prospective client, and you say, hey, you know, I'd love to hear about your challenges, et cetera. And if they say, great, but tell me what you know about me first. And then you're like, oh my God, crickets, because you didn't do your research in advance. So I think Show Me You Know Me can bleed from starting up the, the discovery, not only the discovery call, but the outbound emails. So what are we writing in our outbound emails? How are we showing them we've done our homework on them? How do we show them that we've done our research before a discovery call? And then how do we continue to show that we know them throughout the entire sales process, right? This really bleeds into every fiber and every step. I guess we all have busy schedules, right? Like you have a busy schedule, I have a busy schedule, and I guess all the salespeople out there have. Um, and like, show me, you know me, like it always sounds like a lot of work, like doing a lot of research. How is that possible? How can I do that at scale if I have a full schedule? Well, so that's a great question. Here's what I'll say. If we show up to that discovery call, right, the thing that we work the hardest to get um, to actually get a, a meeting and we show up and we've done no homework on that person, the odds are that we're going to ex exponentially increase the odds of us not furthering that meeting because the person's going to be turned off. So I think this is one of the most critical elements, whether we have time for it or not, or think we have time for it or not. It's a critical element to just see the success, right? It's like, it's as if a rep said, well, I, I'm really busy and I don't have time to do proposals, but I still want to close a deal. But you have to do a proposal. It's a standard part of the sales process, right? I think, think about it too, you know, when your own, your own perspective, right? So Veronica, if I had showed up to this call, right? And I said like, you, um, I didn't know anything about your background. Perhaps I didn't know your location or perhaps I said like, where are you located? Your first instinct might be to think, well, did you look at my LinkedIn? Can't you see any of my background, right? You should have done your homework, right? Like, would, would you yeah, feel a little trapped, yeah. right? Yeah. That's so true. I, 
I think same thing for our prospects. I, the times that people get on the phone and they're like, oh, where'd you go to school? And I'm like, it's right there on my profile. <laughs> <laughs> so I think 10, 10 to 15 minutes of research in advance, even if you have five to seven minutes of research in advance before you send out your outbound campaign or before you get on a discovery call will make all the difference. Mm -hmm. Don't forget to research not only company, the company that you're speaking to, but the person, right? We want to know about that person, where they came from, who they know, where they went to school, all that jazz. Exactly. So um, I think what's pretty common at the moment is saying, yeah, it's not about selling something. It's about building relationships. Now, <laughs> I've... I saw you say your superpower is connecting with people, um, which I guess is super handy, especially being in sales, because your job is to connect with people all day. But as someone who's not, not naturally extrovert um, and is in sales, like how do you get this connection quickly and build up the relationship easily? Yeah, I so I think so much to unpack there as well. A couple of things I would say. <clears throat> One, the connection piece and building that connection, building that rapport. I think it's one, it's an art. But two, I think it's something that a lot of people undervalue or they don't think is a necessary part of the sales cycle. What I'll tell you is one of the most common things I teach is the idea of being better at sales is not just working harder, but it's really about being different. So what are the small things that we can do to be different? like doing our research and like being a connector and forming rapport that make us better and different at our jobs, right? And help us stand out. I think on the connector piece, so um, I talked to my fiance about this a lot. He's, he's more, you know, on the balance of extrovert and introvert, but one of the things he absolutely hates to do is network. And he's like, what do I do when I show up to network? How do I connect to people? Like, I just, I hate it. It makes me very uncomfortable. And I think the tip that I give him and that I would give all of you guys in thinking about making those connections, right, is just asking questions, mm -hmm. right? So it doesn't have to be about you. It doesn't have to be about you sharing or telling a million things about your own private life or your own professional life, but simply show up with some meaningful questions or just something to say to build that connection. Um, tell, tell me a little bit about your, your perspective. So being, being a natural introvert, where, where's the, the hurdle kind of there for you? Um, I think it really depends, especially in today's world um, where we have so many different channels, um, like you have email, you have LinkedIn, um, yeah, you have networking events, or you used to have networking events. Um, <laughs> so I guess it's pretty different. I think it's easy to connect online. Um, it's different being on an event where you have a lot of people and where you just like proactively need to go them and address them. So I think those are two completely different worlds. Yeah. And yeah, it's to get out of this like basic small talk of like, oh, the weather today is great. <laughs> or <laughs> I think that's the challenge to yeah. really dig deeper. I think that that's an interesting thing to the, the weather component that you touch on. So we talk a lot also about building executive presence on calls and <clears throat> executive presence really is yeah. making those connections, not talking about the weather. Unless of course <laughs> there's like some monumental weather thing happening, right? Like a blizzard or a hurricane <laughs> and then, okay, it's newsworthy, right? And all bets are off there. Um, but I would just, I one of the things that I would do to connect with people, especially before you meet them mm -hmm. is just to look at what you can find find out about them online. Um, I, look, I like to look at LinkedIn. If there's nothing there, I'll see if they have a Twitter by chance. If then there's nothing there, then I'll just Google their name and I'll just see, have they written articles? Have they spoken at conferences? Have they contributed a quote to something? Like, is there anything I can find, right, that would help? And then I use that when, when I jump on the call and just say, hey, I saw, you know, this, or I noticed this, or they used to live here or whatever it is just as a way to say, I've done my homework, I've shown them that I know them, and just to build that connective thread. Um, and I think it's a, that's as complicated as it has to be. What was the, the best outreach, cold outreach you've ever received? Do you remember it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so there was a gentleman who I, I will say still hasn't gotten a meeting with me, but it's because there's there's just no product fit, but he is trying. Um, it was it was the show me, you know me, literally followed my advice. And he put a few things that he knew about me in the subject line to capture my attention, right? The subject line is the most important part of our email. If we don't nail that, forget it. 
And then throughout the email, he weaved in things about that he'd, he'd read about me or he heard me speak like direct quotes from things I'd said. And I'll tell you, that is no small effort, right? And he really tried to do his homework. He really tried to connect with me and just say, you know, I've done my, done my work, can you help me? Now, what I will say is that while I haven't taken a meeting with him, I did reward the effort by connecting him to three different individuals that I thought could use his product. So I think that that's another thing to think about. We're so busy, we have so much on our schedules, right? How do we have time to scale this and do show me, you know me? The thing to think about is that the right executives, right, who appreciate that and just appreciate the difference and the effort that you made will try to connect with you, connect you with somebody that could help you, even if they have no need for your product. So think that that effort will pay off at least one way or another, and at least with a handful of executives, if not all of them. Yeah, that's good advice, not only for the people reaching out, but also for them receiving outreach. <laughs> right, yeah. What, what about you? What's what's something really good that you've seen from an outreach perspective? Um, I I think it's super funny. A lot of people still send presents. Um, like oh, yeah. Some companies and they sent you some funny socks or, or cookies or whatever with yeah. like, a funny quote on it. Um, I think that's something that, that I really remember because it really sticks out compared to all those emails and LinkedIn requests and stuff. So, so I'm a big fan of those. Of course, it's harder with everyone in home office, <laughs> but still, I think, I think it's a great idea. Well, and I, I think I'll, I'll give a shout out to a gentleman named Derek. So Derek uh, leads a sales development team at a company called Lessonly uh, in the States. And Derek uh, got my home address. He, he just asked for my mailing address, not, you know, not in a weird way of like, can I, where do you live? But what's your mailing address? And he actually had temporary tattoos made um, of, that said, uh, show me, you know me. And then the urgent bird gets the worm with a pineapple in the middle. So he took Great. all three of the things in my background and just made me something to say, thanks for thanks for putting content out on LinkedIn all the time, which I mean, that that will stay in my mind for forever. That, that's great. I, ne I never got anything that good. <laughs> <laughs> One day, it's a, that, there's, the, there's the goal. <laughs> um, but you're not only a pro in like outreach and prospecting. I know you recently launched a masterclass about um, discovery calls. Yeah. Um, so what I noticed in discovery calls, like there are two, two types of people, two kind of calls. There are those that talk a lot themselves, like, and the prospect is like, okay, is he actually interesting in my challenges and goals? And on the other hand, there are those people that just like have their checklist and ask one question after the other with just budget decision maker and not really having, yeah, having a conversation, like having a real conversation. Like how do I find the balance in between those, those types of calls? Yeah, so I think um, a few things on discovery. So <clears throat> you, I'm sure you see that, see it all the time, just like you said, right? Like we're asking a firing range of questions. We're going through our list of what we have. I think about a discovery call like a first date, you know, and I think everything in sales can go back to dating. But if you, to your first example, if you show up and you talk about yourself the whole time, just think, would you do that in a first date? And if the answer is yes, then we should have a separate conversation, right? To help you with your dating life, because that's never going to work. <laughs> but the second thing is, right? If you come to your first date with a firing range of questions, do you want to get married? Do you want to have children? What's your <laughs> financial credit score? Like all of these things, you're not going to help somebody, right? The idea is for us to get to know each other, right? And especially on the discovery call as a salesperson, it's our job to lead the call and to understand what the challenges of the other person. I think if we reset the idea of the discovery call, it's not about uncovering BANT. It's not about covering, you know, what the exact next steps are and who the decision maker is. It's really about uncovering the challenge. Our one job on a discovery call, especially the first one, is to solve that challenge of the buyer, either by something that we do or by referring them to somebody that does, can help them do whatever it is that they're looking to do. And I want you to think about that. So if we show up to the call and we just ask these questions, it's selfish. Instead, if we show up to the call and if I said, you know, Veronica, if you and I were on a, on a discovery call together and I said, uh, I could tell you a million things about Sam sales, but I would love to hear about you first. Can you tell me a little bit about your challenges, the landscape over there? You know, tell me about your team. I'd love to start with that first, if that's okay. 
what I'm doing with that is I'm saying three things. One, I'm going to tell you about me, but you go first. Then I'm giving you some some um, uh, footholds to, to think about, like your team, your challenges, the landscape, et cetera. So you can think I'm kind of filling the air, you know, using my EQ there to fill that awkward silence while you think. And then final thing is just saying if that's okay, because there could be a chance where, you know, you come on the call and say, I actually have a bunch of questions for you. I already know I want to buy you. I just need to make sure you answer these questions. Or nine times out of 10, you're going to get someone who's going to say, sure. Uh, yeah, let me tell you about our side. And then that's when the magic happens because they're telling us everything that we need to know to sell to them. We're making a list, we're writing that down. And the one more important thing that I'll tell you there is don't interrupt that stream of consciousness, right? I think most reps hear the first thing that we can solve and they're like, oh, let me talk about that. Just <laughs> right, be quiet. Let that go. And then as soon as they're done talking, right, then we go back and we filter our way through all the things that they mentioned. Yeah. How important do you think honesty is in this process? Like if I have a qualification call and I notice maybe it's it's not the perfect fit. Like what you say, would you be honest to the prospect? Or would you, I mean, you need to hit your numbers, right? So would you just like try to push your product um, to them anyway? Yeah, I think sales to me, if this is the space that you want to be in, right? Um, if you want to be in sales and if you want to be in this kind of sales, sales is a long game. So I think what's important one is that we always have our foot in the gas for prospecting. So we have tons of opportunity, right? So even if this isn't a fit, that's okay, right? Like book, book yourself a hundred first dates for that month. That way you don't have to focus on the one first date to try and like get to the end game. But the other thing to think about is that honesty is incredibly important. If this isn't a right fit, right? If they're talking to me at Sand Sales and they're saying, you know, we really need a consultant to help with sales operations and revenue operations. Could I figure that out? Maybe. Is it my strong suit? What I love? No, right? But would I want to bring that revenue anyway? Sure. However, what I'm probably going to do is what I know I'm going to do is be honest with them and say, that's not really my forte. Here is my forte. When you need help with this, come talk to me. But I have an excellent consultant that I can refer you to. If you already took time to speak to me and you sort of trust me enough to give me your time, maybe you'll trust my recommendation and I can help you do something. I will tell you that honesty, number one, will pay off in space because you get to help somebody else, hopefully, that you know that can help them. You're honest with the person when they would probably expect you not to be because you want to make a sale. And when they're ready to buy your services or they know somebody that will need your services, they'll refer you in a second just because you were honest. And full selfishly, in the end, even if we try to push that deal forward, they're probably going to figure out that we're not the right person for them and we'll have wasted hours upon hours time making proposal, time on calls for something that just wasn't going to happen in the end anyway. Yeah. Yeah. May, right. May, like sense. think about like when you go to the mechanic, right. And the mechanic's like, we could fix this for you, but it's unnecessary. <laughs> You're like, I will come to you okay. for the rest of my life. <laughs> like, I love you. <laughs> but like there is a situation where I notice, okay, maybe we're not the right fit, but of course there's a situation where I think, okay, it's a perfect fit. Like this company really, it, it, I can solve their challenge with ease, um, but they say it's not the right fit because of timing, maybe lack of budget at the moment. Um, so I need to find a way, okay, when do I follow up with them? Like when, how do I nurture this lead? Um, I know we had a lot of discussions about that topic in the past weeks. Um, I reached out to a couple of people in my network as well. I asked them, okay, how do you do it at your company just to compare best practices? Yeah. And what I noticed, like no one was really sure about if that's the right way to do it, like they do it. Um, how would you set up like a nurturing process for sales? Yeah. Great question. Uh, I think one one of the things that you said before perked my ears up and um, the idea of we don't have budget for this. So I think one thing to think about is that depending on the size of the company that you're going after, right? Like if you're pitching Sam sales and we say we don't have budget for a hundred thousand dollar solution, we probably don't have budget as much as we want it, right? But what I would think about is that with your commercial grade companies and your larger companies, when you hear we don't have budget, I want you to think about two things. One, it may be that they don't have budget 
outline for this exact thing, but it doesn't mean that they don't have money. And if they don't have budget or if they don't have as much budget, we also haven't proven value. It is almost never about budget. It's about proving value, really solving a challenge, and then helping your buyers figure out how to find money from different teams, from different initiatives, cross-functional partners. There's so much work we can do there. So when you hear we don't have budget, be like, there's budget. I know there is. Um, on, the, on the nurture side, um, here's one of the very easy game changers to think about. Let's say, Veronica, your exact example, right? And saying like, um, we the timing isn't right, but perhaps in 90 days, could you reach back out to us? So I think one thing, I hear people say this a lot where their, their polite pushback is, what will be different in 90 days? Mm -hmm. I personally hate that question because it feels very like conceited. It feels very judgmental. Like, well, Veronica, I'll reach out to you in 90 days, but what's going to be different then? Like, ugh, I hate it. Here's the thing. If you did proper discovery and you really understood what's going on with the client, you know why they need to wait 90 days, right? Or you can, you can kindly say like, tell me a little bit about the initiatives you have over the course of this quarter that make 90 days more feasible, right? Because then you'll get some information possibly that, that you didn't get. But Let's say, regardless, we know we have to reach out in 90 days. So we have from zero, which is today, to 90 to nurture them. And what I find most individuals do is they say, you got it, I'll reach out in 90 days. And they set a reminder in Salesforce for day 89. And then on day 89, they follow up and they're like, Veronica, is now the right time to chat? And you're like, I just want to jump off a ledge. So here's what I would say. Think about how to nurture that prospect, right? Um, in a smart, sequential way. I say with 90 days, every two and a half to three weeks, I like to send a piece of evergreen content or something smart that I already have teed up. When I send that content, think about a few things. One, it does not need to be all work related. So this should not be, you know, anything that's pushing them back to sand sales. The mechanism and the, the idea of nurture is just to give something of value and to remind them that I exist as a human and that hopefully they want to buy from me. So this can also be HBR articles, Harvard Business Review. It can be things from Forbes. It can be things from the Wall Street Journal, the <clears throat> New York Times, whatever, whatever you want. Every two and a half weeks, send something along. And the components of this email are very simple. Hi, Veronica. I saw this piece in the in Harvard in the Harvard Business Review. It made me think of you because, and then I'm tying it to something you and I have talked about. Either a need a challenge or a challenge, a personal something. I'm tying it to something that you and I have talked about. Then I'm giving you my opinion on it, not a novel, one or two sentences of like, I read through this. Here's what I loved about the article. Here's the link to the article. And the closing is the most important part. There is no ask whatsoever. It's just a closing, hope you find this helpful, hope you're having a great week, happy weekend, whatever, nothing. Because if you instead close it with, by the way, do you have an extra, do you have 15 minutes to chat, and whatever? <laughs> okay, people are gonna see right through you and they're gonna be turned off and it's gonna be a wasted effort. So just use that as a lever to nurture, drive value and remind the person that you exist. One other thing, and then I'll stop talking on this. Don't forget the power of LinkedIn, right? That's an extra lever. So go, I, I have a top 50 prospect list every Monday morning. I'm giving all my secrets away here. And now they're gonna, <laughs> now they're, everyone's gonna see me for what I'm worth. Um, but every Monday morning, I'll go to 10 people on my list, right? And then the next 10 next week and the next 10 next week, I'll go to their LinkedIn. I'll see if they posted anything recently. I'll see if they've commented on somebody's post recently and I'll add my thought leadership. Not something like cool post, Veronica, but I'll actually give <laughs> something that's in my brain, right? Because then I'm allowing myself to have my subject matter expertise shown and to stay top of mind with my prospects. So you've got a lot of levers that you can pull there in the 90 days. You said two important things now. First of all, you said nurturing is not really about like promoting the product and like scheduling the next meeting, but about showing you're a human and you want that they buy from you as a human. Right. And second, you said, okay, LinkedIn, and you shouldn't forget LinkedIn and all of this process. Yeah. Um, so combining those two things, how important um, in your eyes is like this, this personal branding on LinkedIn? 
my gosh. Yeah. I, you know, I think I, I couldn't speak more highly of it. And what I will say is you, a couple of things you've got to think about. It takes time, right? It really takes time to develop that brand. <clears throat> I have so many people who say like, well, if I post something today on LinkedIn, am I going to get business out of it? No. If you go to the gym today to work out, you're not going to lose weight and build 60 pounds of muscle. Like it takes time, right? But when, when you get there, it pays off in spades. So what I would tell you is Keep in mind, building a personal brand is who you are consistently for better or for worse, right? If you want to start building a personal brand on LinkedIn, if you want to start sharing content, if you want to start, you know, doing your own hashtag, like hashtag Sam sales, things like that, just do it. Don't make an announcement because this is where I also see people fail. They're like today, every Monday, I'll be posting this. And then three weeks go by, they get very excited of posting for three weeks and then they fall off the bandwagon. And that brands you as somebody who cannot follow through. We will miss sometimes posting on LinkedIn. We'll miss building that branding effort sometimes in one week or maybe in a few days and that's okay. But as long as you haven't committed to doing something like that, nobody's going to be looking out for that and looking for basically for you to not follow through on the commitment. The thing that I would say is if you start to post content on LinkedIn and build a personal brand, you want to think about it in doing a couple in a few different ways. About 70% of your content on LinkedIn should be your own thought leadership. So something that you are giving away as valuable content, as teaching someone something, as a perspective. And then in that 70% should also be you engaging with others. So that's where you go to people's posts. You come to my posts, you go to other thought leaders' posts, your, your clients' posts, your prospective clients' posts, and comment and add thought leadership. Just the power of that is huge in terms of personal branding. You know, I'll tell you as a quick hack, if you're trying to think, okay, how do I speed up my, my name being exposed out there? Go and look for people like myself who have an inordinate amount of followers on LinkedIn and comment on our content. Because guess what? When you do that, you get access to four different audiences, myself, anybody who commented, my network and your network with one post. It's huge. Spend 10 to 15 minutes a day doing that and you'll be in great shape. Now the flip side, where's the other? So that's 70%, how do we get to 100? The 30% piece comes in when you are doing anything that's self-promotional. So an award you want, a product release, you know, someone case study of your client, or you're speaking at a conference, an article you wrote, all that stuff. Keep the bulk of it as thought leadership and engagement with others selflessly, and then work in the little promotional parts here and there in the other 30%. That's really good advice. I need to start uh, working on my own LinkedIn brand. <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm one of those people that always forget to post and stuff. So, <laughs> well, and I'll, I'll tell you. So here's my 30%. Here's my shameless uh, plug. Um, but if you go to our website, uh, samsalesconsulting.com, there's a section under our solutions called Shorts. And it's an annual subscription, very inexpensive, and you get access to all of our video content uh, on there for anything that you want to know about how to get around budget, how to build a great profile, how to use LinkedIn to search for a job for anyone that's looking for one. There's so much there and tons of content uh, to be added. I think we've got 20 videos up there so far. So um, if that helps you, feel free to, we'd love to have you. I bet it helps. <laughs> I already watched a couple of videos and so read good. through a couple of posts. So um, <laughs> I'm so glad. It's really good. I really can recommend to everyone watching. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. I, I guess we have a lot of really good advice um, for frontline sellers um, already. Um, so maybe one more sales leadership related question. Yeah. Um, how can I, as a sales leader, as a sales enablement manager, enable my reps to have more meaningful conversations, especially in a remote setup where I not necessarily can jump into every call and, and guide them through everything? How can I support them? Yeah, so I would say two things on the meaningful conversations. Um, Think back to what we talked about with the discovery calls, just teaching them how to open that conversation up, right? To me, again, the goal of that discovery call is solving the challenge, not working through our own questions. And if we start with the discovery call of tell me more about this, we will have a much more meaningful conversation. The other thing that I would take a uh, huge notice of it, well, I guess two other things, um, it's never just one with me, uh, active listening. So we talk about this a lot. 
Forrester did, uh, Forrester Research did a case study and looked to see the number one thing the B2B buyers want from their sellers, and it is active listeners. So active listening is the act of asking a question, getting the answer, and then asking a second question that uses information from the answer to ask the next question. Again, if we join a call and we're working through our firing range of questions, we're not actively listening, right? And our sellers, our buyers see that. So I would say, ask your reps, you know, listen to recordings if you have gong or chorus or something like that, listen to recordings, even try to have a conversation with them and see if they're active listeners, do some role play there. And if they're not, make that one of the sweet spots that you work on. The next thing I would say to look out for about meaningful conversations is the um, uh, question behind the question. So I talk about this a lot when my very first job uh, out of, out of, in high school uh, was at a, as a lifeguard at Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida. And one of the things that we were taught in basically day one is that Disney's most popular question is what time is the three o'clock parade? Well, it's at three o'clock. So here's the thing. If you are most reps, you're going to say it's at three o'clock. Does that answer your question? And the buyer is going to say it does. Thanks. And then they're going to move on. If you are looking for the question behind the question and teaching your reps how to have these meaningful conversations, it's to say the parade's at three o'clock. And I have a few things to tell you about that. But first, tell me a little bit about why you're asking. We're trying to look at the situation in front of us, right? When somebody asks that and we're looking, you know, is this a family? Do they have children? Is somebody in a wheelchair? Are they short? Are they tall? Are they trying to get out of the park? Do they want to get to a ride? What are they really asking? Because it's not what time the three o'clock parade is. It's just their crutch for asking that for what they really want to ask. So think about that, right? If your prospective clients say, do you have an app? Do you integrate with this? Anytime they ask a question, just think to yourself, why are they asking? Even if it's mostly obvious, ask anyway, because, oh my gosh, will you get tons of information out of that? And again, leading to better conversations. Things like Disney is a, is a good uh, sales school. <laughs> oh my gosh, they're the best. I, I, I advocate everybody to go and work for them and learn about customer service because holy moly. <laughs> okay, um, perfect, Sam. Um, I think that's it for today. I, I, I think that's a wrap. Um, Thank you for having time. me. <laughs> um, I think it was really great. There were so many valuable insights. Um, I guess it helps anyone watching the video, reading the blog article um, to level up their sales. Um, you share a lot of um, interesting posts regularly on your LinkedIn. So make sure yeah. to follow Sam, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me. Right, truly, uh, feel free to, to connect on LinkedIn. If I can ever be of help or if you ever have questions, feel free to hit me up there. I'm pretty responsive. Um, but there's so, so many resources on our website too, uh, totally free and all sorts of stuff there that you can access. So any anything that I can do to help, please let me know. And Veronica, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Sam. Thanks.